Fadina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, MILE. Achilan, everyone. Marhaba. I'd like to thank you for attending this program, and I want to express some appreciation to uh, Mr. Joffrey and Ms. Gosme for all the wonderful work they've done to prepare this program for me and for our listeners. Our title is How to Lead the Way Through the Permanent Whitewater, and we have three topic areas we want to discuss. My intention in this program is to reinforce what you already know. If you've been paying attention and watching any of the wonderful MILE webinars, there's a lot of information out there about change, and I know you know a lot of that information. So I want to reinforce that for you. I also want to refine what you know, polish the beautiful and brilliant diamonds that you are so you can shine even more brightly in your role in your organization. And then I hope to extend what you know somewhat. I hope to give you some opportunities to get some new knowledge, some new information. The quote by Charles Kettering, if you're open to it, I think we'll be able to give you a couple of new ideas, a couple of ideas you haven't thought about. Now, how I'm going to do this, my approach is going to be give you some ideas and examples and then involve you with some very simple activities. I want to offer you some action ideas. Those action ideas are designed to give you some take-home value from this presentation. And then finally, I want to take your questions and comments. So let's talk about our first topic, the concept of how the whitewater is the new normal, as it were. If you've ever gone whitewater rafting, you know the story. You start out, and it's a very calm day, and you're going down the river, and you're enjoying things. And then suddenly, the river turns, and the waves start to become a little bit more dramatic. The water becomes a little bit more chaotic. And then you're into it. There's waves crashing around you. Your boat is being twisted around. And finally, you have to hold on for dear life in order to survive through the white water. However, the river turns again. And once again, you're in that calm, stable state. A book was written by a man named Peter Vail called Managing as a Performing Art. And he said, the world has changed now. The world has changed now. We are no longer in that rapid change and then calm period, we're in a state of permanent white water. It's rapid, it's unrelenting, it's continuous, it's disruptive, it's chaotic. This is the world we live in, and this world isn't going to change. We know what those white water forces are today, technology, our global economy, the war for talent, fickle customers who with a click can go find somebody else to work with, can find somebody else to operate with. What I think is interesting about this whitewater story is that Peter's book was written in 1989. So we've had over 25 years of experience. We've had lessons. We've learned to master methods to navigate through this uncertain, chaotic, complex environment. What that tells me is the whitewater worldscape that we live in can be, needs to be, expected. It can be, it needs to be anticipated, so we can better, be better prepared for it. Another way to say this is change isn't going to change. White water is the new normal. And also what's interesting to me is even though this appears to be a chaotic, disruptive, uncertain world, it's not completely random. Nature isn't completely random. We know that there are patterns in weather. There are patterns in plant life. Animals have patterns. Even our cellular structure is based on different patterns. This is known as chaos theory. Below what seems to be disorder, uncertainty, and chaos is actually a deeper, more underlying, un understandable order. Let me illustrate this with an activity. Let me get you involved a little bit. I'm going to ask you to do some simple math here. If you take out a scratch piece of paper, I'd like you to write a number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9 on that paper. Give you a moment to do that. 
Now we're going to do some simple math. First thing I want you to do is subtract 5 from your number. Now take that new number you have and multiply it by 3. Now I want you to square that new number you have. You know, multiply it by itself. Square the number. All right, you have a few moments to do that. Now this next one's a little tricky, so stay with me. I want you to add the digits of your squared number until you get a one-digit number. For example, if your squared number was 16, if you add 1 and 6, well, now you've got 7. You've got your one digit. If your squared number was 289, when you add 2, 8, and 9, you come up with 19. So that's still two digits. So then you'd add 1 and 9. Now you have 10. That's still two digits. And then you'd add 1 and 0. So you only have a one-digit number. So again, the key is to come up with a one-digit number. All right, let's assume you're there. Next thing I want you to do is to look at that number, and if it's less than 5, I want you to add 5, otherwise subtract 4. Now multiply that number by 2, subtract 6 from that last number you came up with, All right, now I want you to map that number to a letter in the alphabet. For example, if your number was 1, you'd write the letter A. If it's 2, you'd write the letter B. If it's 3, you'd write the letter C, 4D, 5E, 6F, 7G, etc. All right, now think of a musical instrument that begins with that letter. For example, if your letter was G, you could say guitar. If your letter was uh, T, you could say trumpet. If it's V, you could say violin. All right, so now you have a musical instrument. I want you to look at that musical instrument, the name of it, and look at the second letter. If your second letter was Y, for example, think of a color that begins with that letter. So again, if your second letter was Y, you could say yellow. All right, so now you should have a color and a musical instrument. If you came up with a red drum, you just experienced what chaos theory tries to tell us, that below disorder, uncertainty, is a deeper form of order. Underlying what seems like chaos are patterns of behavior. So this is the whitewater story. There is order in whitewater. There is order in chaos. There is order in uncertainty. That order has to be recognized by you, the leader. That order has to be recognized by you in terms of your role as a senior executive. Let me illustrate this with a picture. Most people, when I show them this picture, they can't make out anything. It's meaningless. However, when I show them the second picture, but you should see a cowboy on a horse. You should be able to make out that pattern. Now, if I go back to the first picture, you can see the cowboy on his horse now. What seemed to be disorderly, chaotic, uncertain is now an orderly pattern. This is the world of chaos. This is the whitewater story. There's order and there's a pattern in the whitewater. And you know, when you go whitewater rafting, a good whitewater rafting guide or instructor or leader would clarify this. She or he would explain to you what's coming down the road, would let you know about how to deal with the whitewater. So this is your role as the leader. <clears throat> to read, to understand, accept, and even embrace this white water, to look for the patterns within which you can navigate. And also, the interesting thing to me is people who go white water rafting, they know what's coming. <laughs> when they get into that raft, they know what's coming down the road. In fact, that's why they go white water rafting. They want to experience the challenge. They want to experience the excitement, the energy created by it. So your role as a leader, then, is to prepare yourself, to energize yourself, to focus yourself and your people on this whitewater reality. This is your competitive environment. So we need to set the expectation for success. Expectations are very important because expectations create our world. What we expect is what we get. I want to show you this uh, 
picture up here for just a moment and tell me what it says. Okay, are you ready? Okay. Well, it says once upon a, a time. But most people, when they see that phrase, they see the words once upon a time. They don't see the second A, once upon a, a time. It's because that's what they expect to see. They expect to see once upon a time, and that's what their brain actually computes. So this is the power of expectations. Expectations create our world. What we expect is what we get. So what we need to do as leaders is set success expectations. This creates what is known as self-efficacy. You may know this self-efficacy concept. It's the belief in your ability to succeed in a specific situation. It's the belief in your ability that no matter what happens, you can make it. So self-efficacy in terms of the whitewater world would be to recognize this is the new normal, this is the way things are, and we can navigate through it. So the question is, how do we do that? What are some actions we can take to work through the whitewater reality? Well, the action I'm going to suggest is our second topic. It's what's known as priming. It's what's known as priming. When we prime a pump, when we prime a pump, we're trying to create a flow. We're trying to get the water to move through the pump. Priming in terms of the whitewater world is to create a perceptual connection between and among various, to create a flow of awareness, as it were, so that we are able to work through and recognize the whitewater patterns. Let me illustrate what I mean by creating that flow of awareness, by being primed. When I ask you to, I want you to say the word joke out loud five times. All right? So whether you're working by yourself there or you have some colleagues with you, when I say go, say the word joke five times out loud. Ready, set, go. Joke, 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 joke. Now, say out loud what you call the white of an egg. If you said the word yolk, it's because you've been primed. If you said the word yolk, it's because in the few moments that I had you say joke, your awareness was primed to think of something similar, to expect something similar. Of course, you call the white of an egg the white. You don't call it the yolk. Brand advertising is great at priming us. Nobody buys a BMW. They buy the ultimate driving machine. Nike doesn't want to sell you running shoes. They want to sell you energy, action. They want you to just do it. So this is what priming does. Priming is a technique we can use to prepare for the whitewater world. I had an experience that illustrates this with some of my consulting work recently. I was asked to come into a company that for a hundred years had never had a layoff. In fact, this is what they would promote to their people. Come to work for our company. We don't lay people off. We've never laid anybody off. Well, of course, the reason they hired me was because they had a layoff and they want to do some strategic planning and some team building and help people work through this unfortunate reality of the layoff. So I was interviewing individuals in one-on-one -on -one settings in this one part of the organization, and it was a very uncomfortable experience. They were very unhappy, they complained, they cried, they didn't like it, they were upset, etc. It was exhausting, I have to tell you. But down to my last interview, it was about 4.30 in the afternoon. I had a whole week of this stuff. So a young woman comes into my office, and I said to her what I said to everybody. So how are you feeling about the layoffs? She said, well, not too bad. Uh, why don't we talk about how we're going to work through these layoffs? And I said, wait a minute. You're not upset about the fact that your company's laid people off? She looked at me and laughed and said, this is the third company I've worked in in the last 10 years that has had a layoff. She was primed. She was ready for the change, for the disruption of the layoff, because she had been primed by her previous experience. So this is what we need to do. We need to motivate people's awareness. We need to power prime people is another way to say it. There's an interesting article in the Journal of Experimental and Social Psychology recently. They asked subjects to think of and then write out an experience when they felt more powerful. Just simply write that down. They then had them do interviews. They had them be interviewed as though they were being interviewed for a job. The group that wrote out their powerful experience, that time they felt more powerful, 
were significantly more positive in their interviews than the people who hadn't done so. They were significantly more ready for the interview. They were significantly more primed. So this is our role as leaders. We need to prime people. We need to be what I call our M&Ms, models and motivators. People are looking for models in organizations today. They want to see somebody set a standard that would inspire them. And people want to be motivated. Humans don't start out their work career retired in place. They don't start out in a complaining, upset mode. But somewhere along the way, the motive, the will, the desire to deal with our competitive reality changes. So your job as a CEO, an executive, a senior manager, even a middle manager, any kind of a person who's looked to as a person of authority, is to let people know this is our competitive domain. You have to set the standard for the whitewater. A good example of this is Jeff Bezos at Amazon. When he started his company many, many years ago, he said to his people, we're at day one. We have a journey ahead of us, and we're going to succeed in that journey. Amazon, in, according to 2013 numbers, has over 200 million customers and more than $60 billion in annual sales. When Bezos was asked recently in an interview what's next for his company, he said, we're still at day one. Prime to be a model and a motivator for change. Prime to be a model and a motivator to work people through the whitewater. So this is what I call your inner attention power. You have to first prime yourself. You have to set your mind to accept and to embrace the whitewater reality. This is important because attention creates. What you give your attention to becomes your life. Think of a time recently when you maybe were going to make a major purchase, buy a car. Did you suddenly notice those cars that you were thinking of buying on the street? How come those things appeared? Because they were in your awareness, because you had primed yourself to be ready for them. So this is the priming of your inner attention power. You need to prime yourself. This is what a good whitewater rafting instructor would do. He would prime himself by accessing the information channels out there. He would say, okay, what have we been paying attention to on the whitewater river that we're going to be floating down? What other sources do we need to talk to? Who's been down the river before? Who else can tell us things? What else could we focus on? What other sources should we focus on? This all sounds so easy, right? <laughs> Interesting study done by a man named Sidney Finkelstein. He wrote a book called Why Smart Executives Fail. And he found that most of the reasons these people failed is they wouldn't look beyond themselves. They would never doubt their judgment. They would ruthlessly eliminate anybody who didn't agree with them because it didn't match their paradigm. It didn't match their attention power. So we need to prime ourselves. One way to do this is to look at the tendency we all have for what's called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is that ability to look at what's known and then discount evidence or opinions that contradict it. For example, imagine this scenario that scientists discover two life forms from another planet. And this is what the life forms looked like. And these are the labels they found for the white life forms. Which label do you think they assigned to which being? If you said the one on the left is a booba and the one on the right is a kiki, folks, that's completely arbitrary. There's no rational reason why we should say that. However, because the kiki symbol has those sharp edges, we think, well, that's got to be a kiki. And because the booba symbol has those round edges, we think that has to be a booba. Well, that's what we call confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is a real challenge in the whitewater world because it means we won't accept the new normal. We want things to be the way they've always been. Another way you can prime yourself is looking at the bias for probability neglect. For example, a lot of people are afraid of flying. Have you ever thought of what the odds are of dying in an airplane crash? versus dying in a car accident. The odds are tremendously higher for dying in a car crash, but nobody thinks about that when they get in their car in the morning. However, people become so afraid sometimes when they get on the plane, they have to take some drug to calm them down. We need to look at the possibility that we suffer from probability neglect bias, in which we overstate the risks of relatively harmless things 
and understate the risks of very dangerous things. How that would work in the whitewater world is we wouldn't understand the new normal. We wouldn't look for new ways to recognize the patterns within it. A third way to prime yourself is looking at what's called status quo preference bias. This is also known as change apprehension. This is the time when we make choices that attempt to ensure that things won't change. In other words, we do things the way we've always done them. That means we won't accept the new whitewater world. Not accepting what's happening in your reality will cause you to crash and burn. Not accepting that we all have these biases and we have to look at these biases can limit us. So understanding these biases, of course, can be difficult. Self-reflection can help. We can consciously seek new information channels. We can demand fact-based information. We can ask the question, what do we need to do differently in our whitewater world? We can also get feedback from others. I'm sure you have trusted allies and colleagues whom with you work. You can ask them for feedback. In real time, for example, after a meeting, ask the person, did you notice that in any way I might have been suffering from some bias? I might have been unwilling to be open to, unwilling to be aware of information that was coming in the meeting that would help me understand how to deal with the challenges we face. A trusted ally could give you that information. So in terms of review, Assess your information channels. How can you expand them? What else do you need to know about your competitive environment, about your organization's role in that environment? What are your biases? Analyze them yourself, and then get some feedback from others. Are you suffering from confirmation, probability neglect, or status quo bias? Everyone has biases, so I'm not saying that we can completely eliminate them. What I'm saying is we have to challenge their utility. Is there added value in me looking at my whitewater world this way? And can I alter my behavior in some ways once I understand what those realities are? So this is the inner attention power that effective executives use. But we also need to prime others for the whitewater world. We need to, what I call, motivate their minds. We need to help them accept, embrace, and accept the whitewater world. This is what I call your outer attention power. A recent article in Harvard Business Review, the December 2013 issue, by Daniel Goleman, which actually won an award for McKinsey as the best article of the year. He said, the primary task of leadership is to direct people's attention. And the word attention comes from the Latin attendere, which means to reach towards something. So we need to focus others to expect, prepare, and actually reach for the whitewater world to be willing to and open to utilizing that whitewater world and living in it more successfully. So their study, they, they found there's interesting thing when we prime people. We can prime people to create what we call an approach-based awareness. We can be proactive. They call this a savoring state of awareness. Again, anyone who goes whitewater rafting, they savor that experience. Galinsky and Pandit found you can actually prime people to do this and you can, can also prime people to minimize what they call dread. Dread is that negative anticipation we have. It's why, again, people have a fear of flying, even though they shouldn't, because it's not that dangerous. Dread is a killer in terms of our ability to work through the whitewater reality. So priming can both maximize savoring and minimize dread. So this is your role as a senior executive. Everything you do, everything you say, Every nonverbal gesture you make sends a signal out to your people. So I want you to think about being an M&M, demonstrating to people in your thought, word, and deed that you savor the new normal, and that's what they need to do. That's how they need to function. One way you can do this is constantly pushing purpose forward. Purpose is your business's strategy. It's your business's mission. It's your vision. You need to remind people of that on a regular and consistent basis. I was working with a utility company years ago in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I was there maybe eight days over a three-week period doing some training and some consulting, working in small groups. I personally heard the senior executive of that company at least a half a dozen times give their customer service motto. Everyone wants to do a good job. Everyone wants to serve our customers. That's exactly how he said it. Everyone wants to do a good job. Everyone wants to serve our customers. 
everyone wants to do a good job, etc. Pretty soon I started to believe everyone wants to do a good job in this company. Everyone wants to serve their customers. <laughs> because he had pushed that purpose forward. So we need to push purpose forward regarding our organization's mission and strategy. Mission, as you know, is the business you're in. Strategy is how you compete, how you add value, how you demonstrate relevance in your competitive environment. So your role in priming others is to let people know this is who we are. This is what we do in our competitive landscape. This is the role we have to play in the whitewater world in which we live. Interesting study was done. Percentage of people who clearly understand what their organization is trying to achieve and why. Their mission and their strategy. They asked people to identify whether they truly understood it. Only 37% of the people could actually articulate what they thought their company's mission and strategy was. It's hard, to me, it's hard for me to believe that companies could survive this way. Executives can overcome this problem by pushing purpose forward continually, reminding people on a regular basis, we want to work in the whitewater world. We want to live in this competitive environment. This is what we do. So this is one way we can prime others to be more whitewater ready. Another way we can do it is to surface, discuss, clarify what people's assumptions are about the challenge of change they face. Let me illustrate this with a little activity. Bahir and Wada are brothers. They're born to the same parents on the same day, and they're not twins. Think for a moment, how can this be? They're brothers born to the same parents on the same day, and they're not twins. You see, what happens here is our minds lock up because we have certain assumptions about the problem. Well, if you've seen this little brain teaser before, you know the answer. They have a third brother, Jawad. Bahir and Wada are not twins, they're triplets. Analyzing our assumptions helps us break through the barriers of awareness that limit our ability to deal with change. So your job is to surface assumptions, clarify those assumptions. What might be true in our whitewater world, and how can we verify that? What might not be true? What are we dreading that may never happen? How can we verify, assess those assumptions? Effective executives spend time talking with their people about these kind of things. So this is your job. Push purpose forward on a continuous basis. Remind people of what your mission, vision, strategy, outcomes, goals are. Let people know they will and they can succeed. And then constantly clarify assumptions. Clarify what's valid and what's not valid. Now, if you're going to do this, what you're ultimately going to do is going to create an empowered workforce. You're going to create an entrained workforce. You're going to create a situation in which everybody thinks like an owner. Imagine that. Imagine if everybody in your organization thought, this is my company. We know this from research on entrepreneurs. They're 24-7 on their company. They're focused constantly on their environment. They're ready for what's going on. Empowerment and entrainment are techniques to create that sense of self in which everybody thinks like owners. Empowerment has two components. There's an inner component or individual component of empowerment. And that's what we call the inner locus of control, that desire to step up. You want to work through the whitewater challenges. You're primed to ride the waves because you have that inner locus of control. Empowerment also has an organizational component, an external component. And that means the organization allows people the freedom to make decisions. It allows people to take action. It supports them and acknowledges them for taking those kind of actions, for doing those kind of things. Entrainment's a little different. Entrainment was discovered back in the 1860s. Uh, it's what they also call mode locking. <clears throat> it's when two systems that actually are independent of each other start operating in a synchronous fashion. The ways this was discovered was a man had a clock on a table, and you can hear the clock ticking at a certain pattern. There was another clock on a different table clocking at a different speed. Just by accident, this is how a lot of these things occur, the man put the two clocks on the same table, and they started to tick at the same rate. This is called mode locking. So entrainment is that process of locking people in, getting their awareness locked into a mode to be ready for the permanent whitewater. 
So one way to do this is to assess the people you're working with, assess your staff on what I call the change continuum. The change continuum has three components. Some people are change resistant, others are change reluctant, and then others are change ready. Your job is to start with the change ready. They are your core cadre of the committed, I like to call them. They're the ones you can work with first and easiest because they savor the whitewater reality. These are the people you can use empowerment techniques on. So my suggestion always is empower the ready. Create that core cadre of the committed. Trumpet this group as a key to organizational success. Make them visible. Give them status. Make them relevant to everyone else in your organization. I had an interesting experience doing some consulting work recently with a manufacturing company. The manufacturing company had created a core cadre of the committed after we did some change leadership training with them. They asked for individuals who wanted to be on this committee. They got 50 names. They only wanted 25. So they picked 25. And they called them the core cadre of the committed. They asked me to come in and do some team building with this group to make sure that they were working together as a successful group. About six months after this group had been formed and had started working together, over 100 people wanted to join the group because they had emerged as the change-ready group. The senior management had empowered this group and had created a ripple of empowerment through the organization. They had multiplied the change-ready, whitewater-ready reality. So we need to give the change-ready people that role. We need to give them that status. We also need to give them responsibility to deal with a critical aspect that affects how organizations work through change and that is the systems that affect how people operate. Every organization has a variety of systems. Those systems can be formal. You have an information management system. You have a decision system, a recruitment, a selection system. And those systems can be informal. This is what we call group norms. Norms are sort of those standards of behavior that we're expected to adopt. They're not rules or policies, but you know this. They're standards of behavior. Like there's a standard for dress in an organization. There's a standard for etiquette in an organization. We don't have to have a rule for that. Well, if you give this core cadre of the committed the opportunity to review those formal systems and see which ones reinforce dread, which ones reinforce biases that limit our ability to work through the whitewater, and which informal norms reinforce the negative aspects of dealing with whitewater. So if we empower those people to look at those systems and then give them the opportunity to review them, modify them, and then pilot test alternative systems to give them a chance to maximize firm-wide readiness, because everybody's affected by those formal and informal systems. Again, an organization I worked with years ago, a retail organization, we had done some customer service training. And this company invested a lot of time and effort in this customer service training program that I created. Senior manager was frustrated, though. After a few months, he said, I'm not seeing a lot of change on the shop floor. I'm not seeing a lot of customer change in certain stores. So he did an analysis of the systems the organization had in place. And one of the systems they had in place was how they rewarded people's behavior. The bonus for the store managers in this company was based purely on a financial number. They called it dollars to man hour. How many dollars do you spend? How many man hours do you have? Because that's your biggest cost in a retail environment. And what they found was the bonus was based on the most efficient dollars per man hour. And it turned out of the 50 stores in this company, the two managers who kept getting the highest bonuses also provided the worst customer service. They would cut staff so that their dollars per man hour numbers looked better, which of course reduced service. They would minimize the cleaning schedule in the restrooms and on the uh, company's floor to minimize cost. So I was able to convince the senior manager to get a team to look at how they could modify their reward structure. They changed the reward structure so that 25% of the store manager's bonus was based on customer service. Within 30 days, these two managers quit the company, those two managers who 
weren't providing good service. The senior manager then started seeing results from the customer service training program because we changed one of the systems. So empowerment would be create that core cadre of the committed. Because they're change ready, get them to be models and motivators for change throughout the company. Now the reluctant and the resistant, this is going to be a little bit tougher. People who are in these two change modes are going to be a little harder to work with. But there are some things we can do. First of all, we need to understand why do people behave this way. Most humans are not evil, crazy, or stupid. They have, in their mind, logical reasons why they behave that way. In fact, we know from neuroscience that humans are hardwired to respond to change in certain ways. We know that early humans were wary of differences. If a tribe of cave people from another part of the environment came, people were wary of them. They were watchful for the tigers and the lions and the bears because they knew that those could be dangerous. And when they were huddled in their cave at night around the fire and they heard a strange noise outside the cave, they became very sensitive to it. So in our dinosaur brains, is what neuroscience calls it, we're hardwired to be resistant to change. We're hardwired to be reluctant to change. Hardwiring translates into a couple of different responses people have. And probably in terms of the whitewater, fear is the most common response. We fear things because we're uncertain about them. We fear things because we're anxious about them. Let me give an example. Imagine you come home one night and you thought you left the light on in the kitchen or in the living room. Yet the house is dark. And when you enter the house, you hear a noise in the house. What are your thoughts? You're afraid because you're uncertain, because you feel anxious, because you didn't expect that. Remember, expectations are important here. And so consequently, you respond in a more reluctant, resistant way. We also experience reluctance and resistance by being powerless. Powerless means we don't feel competent. We feel a sense of a little bit off balance, as it were. Let me illustrate this with an activity. When I say the word go, I want you to write the digits of your birth date in the following form, two digits for day, two digits for month, and four digits for year. You're going to have five seconds to write this number. All right, when I say go, you'll have five seconds. Ready, set, go. All right, time. Now, I'm guessing most of you were able to write the digits, and they look pretty clear. Now I want you to put your pen or your pencil in your other hand. And now you're going to write those same digits with your other hand, day, month, and year. You're only going to have five seconds to do it. Ready, set, go. Time. My experience in doing this in training seminars is most people do not finish the second time. And look at the quality of your work. Look at the quality of your handwriting when you had to write with your other hand. Unless you have the good fortune to be ambidextrous, most people don't want to write their month, day, and year with their opposite hand. They want to go back to the way they've always done it because they feel powerless. They've lost their sense of competence and confidence in themselves. So reluctance and resistance are hardwired in our brains. We feel powerless. Also, in terms of change especially, people feel reluctant and resistant because they don't see any benefit. They think this is just going to be more work for me, more work for my coworkers, and so they're going to resist the change. So what we need to do is entrain people to work through reluctance and resistance. We need to meet people at their level to lead them to ours. One way to do this is identify the specific reasons that people feel reluctant and resistant. We can know generally it's fear or it's powerless or it's no benefit, but what are the specific reasons? And we need to acknowledge to people that, yes, we know this is going to be a challenge. We're in the white water. That's our business. That's our vision. That's our mission. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So we can entrain people by giving them more information. Because we know that knowledge dispels fear. When you come into a dark room, you can analyze the darkness. You can measure the darkness. You can figure where did the darkness come from. Or you can turn on the light. Because the light eliminates the darkness. Knowledge is like bringing in the light. Knowledge also puts people in their power. When we understand something more effectively, we feel more confident. When we understand something more fully, we feel more capable. 
And also, we need to provide knowledge so people do see the benefits of working through the whitewater. They do see the value added in engaging in their competitive environment. Sounds so simple again, but it's not. They've done some research. What do people do when they do not have information? Well, they wonder. They speculate. They make things up, and they don't make it up better. If people are in a reluctant and resistant mode to the whitewater world, they don't assume things are going to be better. They experience dread. Their bias, their priming is to experience dread. In fact, some interesting research was done on mergers and acquisitions, which are, of course, major changes for organizations. And they found that the number one reason people were resistant to mergers and acquisitions was they lacked an understanding of why they were merging, why they were being acquired or acquiring some company, and more importantly, how to make it work. They couldn't see down the road. They couldn't see down the river to work through it. So one way to deal with this, this uncertainty, this ambiguity with the reluctant and the resistant, is to use what I call the three Ds questions. What do we need to discover about our white water world? What is it we don't know? So we go back to information channels. We go back to maximizing information awareness. What do we need to discuss? Because you see, people will have different perceptions about the white water, different perceptions about the competitive realities. Those differences can help us understand the world better. We can gain another perspective and get different alternative points of view. But those differences can also cause chaos because we don't talk about them. So a good discussion about why do you see it that way and what is it you see that I don't see would help us work through the reluctance and resistance people experience. And finally, we can also clarify where we're possibly in denial. This is where those biases that we all suffer from come. We're in denial. We don't want to accept the whitewater world. We don't want to accept the reality in which we face. Again, all this sounds so simple and obvious, right? But we have to overcome a simple tendency that a lot of senior executives have, the tendency to not provide information. They did some research. They asked managers, how often do you provide information for your staff? What would you guess the number was? It was 80% of the time. They then asked these same managers, staff members, how often do you get information from your manager? What do you think the number was? It was 20%. This tells me some very interesting things. Either managers are not providing information, or they're not providing value-added information, or they're not willing to accept alternative information sources and discuss them with others. So we need to work through the whitewater world by providing information. We need to explain what we know about the whitewater world, indicate when we'll be able to provide more information. By definition, because the whitewater world is uncertain and chaotic, we can't know everything. So we just let people know, here's what I know now, here's what I'll be able to tell you as we move down the road. We need to let people know what we know about the whitewater world, and we have to also realize that information is absorbed slowly in times of change. When people are reluctant and resistant, we have to repeat again and again. We have to remind them again and again. Here's what's happening, here's why it's happening, etc. We also sometimes need to create what I call the script for success. What are the steps we need to take today? Well begun is half done. You know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step, etc. You probably know all those things. So that script for success would I use what I call is the Swiss cheese approach. The difference between Swiss cheese and regular cheese is that Swiss cheese has a lot of holes in it. So we take the big job of working through change and we make it lots of little jobs. So that would help us deal with powerlessness and fear. And now we're at the slide that has to do with that radio station that everyone's tuned into. You've probably heard this before. It's called WIIFM. What's in it for me? Why should I go down this road? We need to find out what the other's frequency of WIIFM is. We need to understand what station they're tuned to, what are the biases they're working with. And then we need to clarify them the, to them, with them, the consequences, both positive for being change ready and negative for not being change ready. All of these things require discussion, they require interaction, they require time and effort. But if we don't do them, then people are just going to hold back. They're not going to work through the whitewater world. 
if we were literally whitewater rafting, they're not going to paddle properly, they're not going to adjust themselves properly. They're an organization, they're not going to be responsive to customer needs, they're not going to be responsive to technological changes, etc. Another thing we do is focus on small wins early. Uh, I played soccer in college, and you don't score a lot of goal, goals in, in a soccer game, but you keep attacking. You keep moving the ball down the field. You keep moving forward. This is what we need to do if we're going to work people through reluctance and resistance. We need to focus on small wins early, acknowledge those small movements away from reluctance, away from resistance, towards readiness to keep people entrained with the process of change. And then I think we also have to accept the simple reality. Not everybody is going to get past their reluctance and resistance. There are some people who are just stuck in the way it's always been. They're what I call retired in place. These people probably should have never been hired. They probably should have never been promoted. They probably should have been let go. This is a tough one. But managers, that's part of your job, is to hold people accountable. That means you're counting on them to do their job. One way to do this is what I call name the game. When you have a person who's just, no matter what you do, keeps pushing back and pushing back, you name the game. You clarify the behaviors they're using that indicate reluctance and resistance. For example, they're always complaining about the new change system. They're always arguing with people about that they don't want to do something. Clarify the specific behaviors. And then you just need to say, as the manager, these are no longer acceptable actions. We will no longer accept these behaviors as part of this organization. That may mean, as that one company had to do that I mentioned, changing the way people's bonuses or promotions or performance evaluations are created. That would be a systemic change you'd have to make. Or it might just be a one-on-one -on -one coaching session where you explain to people, this is what has to change. You create a performance improvement plan with them and then hold them accountable for it and use that in, as part of their review process. We also can enlist the support of others. Sometimes a middle manager will be struggling with change. She or he has to get his or her senior manager on their side. Because you don't want to try to hold people accountable for not changing. Go to your boss and have your boss say, well, just let it go. I've seen this too many times. It crushes the motivation of the empowered manager. It crushes the motivation of the empowered staff. We can also realize that the change ready group, as happened in that one company I mentioned, they, they are M&Ms for change. They're positive models. So they can help create critical mass. What I find in organizations, when you have that core cadre working well, they draw other people to it. They start to create a buzz around what they're doing and people want to be involved in it. So this is empowerment and entrainment. Ask questions to provide information. Write out the script for success. Break the big job into lots of little jobs. Find out why people are resisting change. Focus on small wins early. Name the game. And enlist the support of others. So hopefully these have been some practical ideas you can use, some ideas that you can apply. Ideally, you've been trying some of these things, and hopefully you've been getting good success. Maybe you can refine your approach to try some of these ideas, and maybe you can try new ideas if you've never tried them. I'd like to thank uh, Ali and Ms. Cosme for all the wonderful work they did to prepare me for this program, and I hope we all appreciate the work that they're doing with Mile. It's really a wonderful website, and there's been wonderful programs. I'm so delighted to be part of it. I also want to remind you the whitewater story is that when we get into the raft, we know what's coming. And that's why we're in the raft. So you're in a competitive environment because you want to be there. Your organization has decided to stake its claim in its mission and its strategy. So we need to be excited by it. We need to be M&Ms for change. We need to entrain the reluctant and resistant. We need to empower the change ready. And we need to be the models and motivators for change. The white water is the new normal. This is our world. This is our time. You can't push the river or stop the river. You have to engage in it. So one way to make some value out of this webinar and others you take is to think of what we've talked about and think on paper is what I always like to say. Create a list of action ideas that you felt were useful from today's program. And then use what I call as the one-at-a-time rule to master that list. 
you're not going to be 100% different after listening to a 30, 40 minute webinar or a one, five, or even 10 day training program. You're not going to be 100% different. But if you work on one thing at a time and you make a 1% improvement each week, in two years you could be totally transformed. When I was a young man in high school and college, I was so shy I couldn't speak in front of a group. I was so introverted I couldn't talk to uh, the female students and ask them for a date. I had to work on my ability to speak in front of organizations. I had to work on my ability to feel more confident. 1% change will be done as half done. 1% change each week and you can transform yourself and transform your organization. So I'd like to thank you for your time and interest. Hopefully you got some value added out of this presentation and I'd be delighted to hear your questions and comments and spend some more time with you talking about how you can lead the way through the permanent whitewater. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for a very, very, or very interesting presentation. I would like to also thank you on behalf of uh, the Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship. Uh, and folks, um, any questions if you have, you can either put it in the question box or you could raise your hand and uh, I should give you an opportunity to speak directly to the speaker. We do not have any questions at the moment, but we'll wait for a few seconds or a minute. Let's see. I mean, I've already posted. You can put the question in the question box. So by the time you have raised hands, let me also tell you folks that we are recording this webinar and the recorded version will be available on Mile Community, which is communities.mile.org. You should also be able to download the soft copy of the presentation from our Mile Community. So please stay tuned to the community.mile.org or to the webinar.mile.org URL. Can we have a question from Mr. Weil Hussein? The question is, what shall I do with the team that is losing interest in work at this company? Well, it's a tough one, and there's no easy answers because it's a complex problem. My starting place would be to find out what are the reasons that are causing them to lose their interest in work. What has happened that has caused that to occur? I know a lot of companies that I work with now, we have individuals who are nearing retirement. In the U.S. and globally, we have this problem of a lot of people are nearing retirement. They've been in their jobs 20, 30 years. They've got two or three years to go, so they're just going to wait it out. What's changed that caused that? Is it that their people are moving towards retirement, as we see in a lot of organizations? Or is it that some change has occurred where people see no benefit, or they're now afraid, or they feel powerless? This requires some good communication skills on your part, some good question skills, some good active listening skills, and some empathy skills. You know, I don't have to agree with somebody who's resistant to change that their resistance is worthwhile. But I can be empathetic. I've been resistant to change. So that would be my first step. Find out why they're resistant. Once you've found out some of those reasons for that resistance, for that not wanting to work, Look at the individuals in that group. There's always some who are a little less resistant to a little more ready. Work with them first. Yeah, so the answer or the, or the suggestion is what caused people to start to feel this way? Was it systemic? Was it individual? Once you understand that and you've been re accepting and receptive to that, who's a little more change ready than others? Pull them aside and say, okay, what can we do together? Make them part of the problem. This is that idea of helping people think like owners. An owner takes responsibility for something. She or he is able to respond. That's what responsibility means because they feel a sense of ownership. Take the ones who are the more change ready, less change resistant, more willing to work, less resistant to work, and, and make them part of the solution to the problem. Have them be your emissaries, as it were. And I think also there's, there comes a point, and this is why we have managers, you have to draw the line and say this is no longer acceptable. Better to spend one sleepless night letting somebody go than spend months and months struggling with somebody who's just not willing to perform to the adequate level. So those are a couple suggestions. Uh, I'd be interested if that uh, adds any value and or if there are other questions from other individuals. Okay, we have one, uh, another short question from Brother Issam Abdullah. The question is, what if the change that I supported goes wrong? That's the world, isn't it? You're going down the river and you told your people, you're the whitewater rafting instructor, that when they get to this turn, everybody pulled to the right and the river changed and so the boat capsizes. Change happens. Stuff happens. One thing you can do is 
prime people for that possibility. No one can control the future. No one can control the river. But you can let people know, here's our best guess estimate of what we think is going to happen when we go into this competitive environment, when we take this action with our customers. We've analyzed it. We've thought it through. And then you're looking for the signals that maybe you made a wrong choice. And as a uh, proverb, it's after you're going down the wrong track, it's better to turn back than keep going. So the way I interpret that is we're going down the track, and suddenly we realize we've made a wrong turn. Change as quickly as possible. Alter course as quickly as possible. Accept responsibility for the fact you did your best work. You thought this was going to be a successful course of action, and it wasn't. What can we do about it now? And then again, make this everyone's problem. We too often play the blame game. People want to blame their parents. They want to blame their teachers. They want to blame their boss. They want to blame the government. The blame game doesn't solve any problems. Fix the problem instead of fixing the blame. So acknowledge that we're either on the wrong track now or it seems like we're on the wrong track. What can we do about it? That's when that 3D questions come in. What more do we need to know now so we can alter course? What do we have to discuss about options so that we don't we make the same mistake again? And where are people just in the blame game? Those people need to be confronted and say, this isn't helping. Fix the problem, don't fix the blame. So those are a couple of thoughts to deal with that very difficult reality that you've made the wrong turn, you've gone down the wrong road. Comments about that or other questions? Well, uh, currently no other questions, sir. So that really brings us towards the end of the webinar. And um, I would like to once again thank you on behalf of the Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship uh, for your time and for your interesting presentation and look forward to sir, remaining engaged with you and would love to have another series of webinars with you. But thank you very much sir once again and thank you all of those who participated in this webinar and for our, uh, for your time please stay tuned to webinar.mile.org for our all upcoming webinars and uh, to download the soft copy of the presentation uh, in a day or two we will be uploading the whole recorded version so please stay tuned to community.mile.org. Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, MILE.